Good morning, Church on the Hill. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. If you would, let's stand and let's worship the name of the Lord together. Put your hands together. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day you made. So I'll rejoice and be glad, rejoice and be glad in it. This is where I believe you are more than enough, more than enough for me. Amen. He's faithful. You are faithful to your promise. You are strong when I am. When I'm standing in your presence, I have everything I need. Oh, we sing it. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's more than a feeling. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, bless his name. Come what may, you are worthy of all, worthy of all my praise. Cause you are faithful to your promise, you are strong when I am weak. When I'm standing in your presence, I have everything I need. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Sing it loud. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh my soul. Oh my soul. Bless His name. All that is within me, say. The joy of the Lord. The joy.
is a good day to be in the Lord's house. Let's continue to worship together. Hey. You know, let's see it. This is my story. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. Oh, and I tried. I tried with all my might. I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. Yeah, a vagabond. And just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe my doubts will burn. Yeah, like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends. The burden and bitterness. You can't just keep it moving. No, you ain't welcome here. Now till I walk the streets of gold, I'll sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. You picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name. Right here. Is this yours? Oh, I've been found by the grace of God, and hell has lost another one. Amen. Let's see it. To his name, hell lost another one. I, I am free. Oh, I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. Oh, I am free. Can yeah. hell lost another one? I am free. You sing. Oh, I am free. Oh, I am oh, free. Church on the hill, sing like you mean. Hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. Oh, I am free. Can hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. Can hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. You heal my heart, you change my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I think the master, I think the savior. Deserving of our praise. In Chronicles, we read this. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. 35 says this. Cry out, save us, God our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations. 
That way we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. As we sing this next song, I want us to praise the Lord with everything that we have. Leave nothing. Leave nothing. I want us to lift a shout to the everlasting who is worthy of our praise. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to Mountains bound 
we thank you Lord that you are deserving of praise Lord that as we'll as we inch up on Easter and the celebration of your resurrection Lord today I pray that we would look inwardly and see how you have resurrected us brought us out of darkness and into your marvelous light God we love you speak to us through your messenger through Bryce our high school director speak to him today Lord let his words be your words in Christ and we pray. And the church said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Pastor Scott. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome to this beautiful, sunny California day today, right? Awesome. Hey, if you're new to our church, just visiting or checking it out online or in person, there's a way for you to kind of get to know us a little bit. You can scan this QR code on your screen at home or on the screen here. And it's just a way to start a digital chat to say hi and uh, for us to talk. So uh, if you'd like to do that, we'd love to, uh, to get to know you a little bit. I want to tell you about a couple things that are going on, actually more than a couple things today that are going on. We have a team at our church called the, Compa- the City Compassion Team. And what they do is they plan and execute uh, compassion projects around our city. And if you love that part of our mission, right today, after this service, through those doors, there's a room called the studio. There's going to be a brunch there that's going to talk about those projects and that team. You don't have to sign up, you can just show up to that if you love that part of our mission and want to know more about it. Um, Also, this year we're going to begin a brand new village transformation project. It's in Peru, and we've already started by donating money to them so that they can have clean water, clean running water in their village. And so they're working on that now, and um, we're going to have a meeting on what that project looks like. And on the 14th, the 21st, right through these doors in the prayer room, uh, if you want to know more about what we're doing in Peru, or we're going to send a team there in the fall, if you want to know about that, you're welcome to join that meeting. You only have to go to either the 14th or the 21st, one of those. Now, you might not be concerned about stuff that's going on in a village far, far away. You might be a little more concerned with, like, what's happening closer to home, like in your home. So we actually have two things for you. We have a marriage workshop 
It's going to happen. Uh, it's going to come up on April 19th. It's a Friday night. We're going to get together, and uh, it's going to be a, more of a practicum where it's not just someone talking at you, but we're going we're to have some exercises and things around the table that will really help us build healthy marriages. The other is this. We've had a community group at our church that's been going on this marriage retreat for seven years, and we're opening up to the whole church. We have limited spots for this, but it's at a beautiful place called Hume Lake. If you've never been there, you got to go there and try it, but that's going to come up uh, pretty quick here in May 17th. You can go on our website or on our church center app and sign up for that. And most of these events, you can always go on our website, click on events, and find out information about any of these. All right, next weekend, the Super Bowl of the church, right? That's how we like to think about it. I mean, it's Easter, right? It's the greatest event in the history of the world, which means there's several things happening around that. We relaunch a new community group season. Why? Because showing up on Sunday morning, it is not enough for us to develop our spiritual lives. We want you to have people that you know and that know you. So maybe you don't belong to a group, or maybe you signed up for a group and never showed up to a group last season. Hey, no shame, no guilt. Just maybe it just wasn't the right group. It wasn't you, it was them, right? So we really want to help you find the right group. So honestly, today, if you know who some of our staff are, just stop us and be like, hey, I need to find the right group. Um, you can always email Josh at churchonthehill.com and, and do that. Also, next Sunday on Easter, in the studio, you can go there and meet some of our staff and just tell them, Help me find the right group, and we, you'll walk out knowing what group to go to. All right, that's part of it. Our Easter celebration includes a Good Friday service, and this year, that service is going to happen on, all right, this side of the room. <clears throat> You're with me. You're tracking. Uh, Good Friday service. It, it is a, a moment where we pause, and it, there's a somberness to that. We remember what Christ went through on the cross. And so there's a group, we'll have a class open for our preschool and youngers, but the rest of the kids, have them join us. It'll be a family-friendly service for that. Uh, I will also say this, at our information booth out in the lobby today, uh, you can pick up one of these Easter invitations. And can I just say, it's not for you. <laughs> it's for you to give away. Would you go grab as many as you're willing to give to your family and friends who don't have a place to celebrate Easter? They might not even have thought of going to church on Easter, but more people are likely to say yes to a personal invitation on Easter than any other Sunday for the rest of the year. And how about we do this? How about we all join this week in, in praying for that moment a week from today that people would really sense that God met them in a personal way in this room. Can we just agree to pray for that? Amen? Awesome. All right. Last thing is this, uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you wake up in the morning and there's like a verse rattling around in your head or like a phrase that you're like, I think that's in the Bible. I woke up this morning with these phrases in my head and they were rattling around. I had to look it up. It was Jeremiah 29, 13. <clears throat> Before I read this, by the way, this might just be for me. It might not be for you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And it just made me pause this morning as I was kind of sitting on the couch having my coffee going, have I given you all my heart? And, and, and when I approach you, God, am I giving you all of my heart? We have a phrase that's just called half-hearted, right? Have you ever done something half-heartedly? And so um, this is the part of our service where we give our offering. And we say, and by the way, if you're new to our church, this is not for you, because you don't know us well enough to trust us with money, okay? Get to know us. We're trustworthy. Um, but when I read this verse, I was thinking, God, when I give, is it half-heartedly, or is my whole heart in what I'm about to do? And so there's ways to give. It's on the screen behind us, and if this is your church, um, maybe this isn't just for me. Maybe it is for you to just ask this question. Um, is your whole heart in what you're giving? We'll pause there. Here's my treat for you today. <clears throat> you got a big treat coming your way. Some of you already know what this is, uh, but our high school director, he's going to open God's Word for us today. And this is going to be his very first message ever delivered here on this stage at Church on the Hill. <laughs> See, you already got the idea, right? <clears throat> so I want you to encourage this young man and bring to the stage Bryce Braga. Put this here. Feeling well loved today. Thanks, guys. 
As Scott said, my name is Bryce. I've been here at the church for almost three years now, working with you guys as high schoolers. Uh, and it is just so exciting for me to be with you guys today, this morning. But I recognize for three years, I've been up in the high school room, hidden up there, and a lot of you guys might not know me personally. And so if you would, I would love to tell you guys a little bit about me. And so to do that, let me just tell you guys a story about little Bryce, if that's okay. All right? And so come with me. The year is 2002. I'm five years old. And I'm sitting in this green uh, foldable camping chair. In front of me is the fireplace. All around me are the oak trees and the redwood trees that make Big Sur so beautiful. Or, my, or Santa Cruz, wherever I was. Um, and that's in front of me. To my left is my sister playing in the dirt with sticks and rocks, doing her thing. And behind me are my parents. And they're at the picnic tables. And they're setting up for dinner, and they're getting everything ready for the night. And I'm just sitting there watching the fire get started, starting to become evening. And then all of a sudden, I hear something. And I look behind me, and something darts into the middle of our campground. And it jumps into one of our storage bins. And then it pops out after a couple seconds of, like, rattling around in there. And it, in its mouth, a bag of marshmallows. And I'm staring at a raccoon who is trying to ruin camping for me. Because I'm five. Camping is the s'mores. I need those. I need these marshmallows. And so he's almost taunting me. And he looks at me and he makes a run for it. And then I look at my dad. We lock eyes. And he says, Bryce, go get those marshmallows. <laughs> and obviously he's joking. But I'm five. I haven't mastered the nuance of his sense of humor just yet. I'm still learning it, honestly. Uh, I don't have it down. Um, and he's kidding, but I take it seriously. And I just assume he cares as much about those marshmallows as I do. Because they were my everything at that point. And so in an instant, I jump out of my chair and I run after that raccoon. And when I say in an instant, like this guy was never out of my sight. I was after him. I was out of the campground. I was out of the campsite. I went into this ravine, into this dried up creek bed, and I'm following it turn after turn. He's looking over his shoulder at me. How is this kid still there? How is he still after me? He's determined. And I was. And so I'm chasing him for what feels like a long time. And eventually, he decides he's going to make his next move. And he takes a sharp left turn out of the dried creek bed into some low laying brush. And he thinks he has me, but he doesn't. See, he goes under the brush, and then I'm like, I, I need to make my dad proud. I need to go get these still. I'm not giving up yet. And so I get on my hands and knees. I start crawling under the bushes after him. And he's shocked now. So he turns around. He drops the marshmallows there in between me and him, almost as if it's like, all right, here we go. And um, he gets big. He gets on his two feet. He puts his his paws up. He starts hissing and growling at me. And I start hissing and growling back. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> I, I, just, I, I, was, I was scared a little bit, but I also was driven by making my dad proud and by saving camping. And so I just stay there. I'm frozen. And he's like, okay, maybe it's not working. And so after five minutes or so, after I had left the campground, I return with the marshmallow bag held over my head. <laughs> The spoils of war, my first great triumph, my first great victory. I'm so proud of myself. I did it. I made my dad proud. We could continue camping. We didn't have to go home. A few years later, uh, me and my family like to recount stories like that. Uh, and I'm talking to my parents about it. And I realize my dad has a little bit of a different recollection of that day than I do. Because he had to answer to my mom on why he sent a five-year-old after a raccoon for something that could have been bought for $2.99 at Safeway. He's like, Doug, that's not worth it. He's like, I'm kidding. He's like, yeah, but he's five. He didn't get it. And so my dad learned something that day. He learned that I am a son who looks up to him. I value what he has to say to me. I look to him for leadership and guidance, and what he says matters, and I take it to heart. He is an impressionable son. 
About seven years after my first great triumph, uh, I'm an incoming middle schooler. I'm going into the sixth grade, and I'm at the church I grew up at, and I walk into those doors, and immediately, just so you guys know, I was, I was that kid that everyone looks at, and they're like, no way that's a middle schooler. You know, I'm like, I'm like four two, four, however short is short for middle school, I don't remember. I look like a child, because I am. I walk in there, and I'm shy, and I think everyone is looking at me. Everyone seems to know people already. They're all talking to people. Uh, they all seem to have friends. And I walk in there, and I just feel this wave of insecurity and doubt, like, oh, I don't belong here. They're all going to know I don't nobody, know anybody here. And so I'm looking at the couch to my left. Maybe I can sit there. I'll be alone, but I could sit there and act like I know what I'm doing. I could find a game to keep myself busy. Uh, to act like I belong there. And I have all these things going through my head. And then I'm going through that. I hear my name called. I hear someone say, Bryce. And I look. And it's a man named Andrew. And I know Andrew. I couldn't believe Andrew knew me, but I knew Andrew. He was the middle school pastor at the time. And not only that, he was in charge of high school also. So he was the youth pastor. He was this big shot on campus in my eyes. He was this guy that everyone wanted to be around. Everyone wanted to hang out with him. Everyone wanted to spend time with him. He was, he was cool. He was smart. He was funny. He was athletic. He was all those things you want. And he knew who I was. And so all of a sudden, all that insecurity and that doubt, it was gone in an instant. And I knew I belonged. And he gave that to me. And so with my dad, that's when he learned I was impressionable. But by the time I got to middle school, I started realizing for myself that I was very, very impressionable, that I looked to people for guidance. I cared what other people had to say. And I've been so blessed to have men like my dad, men like Andrew in my life that have pointed me to who Jesus is. And that's the reason why I'm on this stage. Because I, if I can just make a student feel comfortable and like they belong in the house of God, and that through that, eventually they can encounter a loving God who wants a relationship with them, and they can meet Jesus for themselves, then I know I'm living in my purpose. I know that's what God made me for. And so that, that's what I do. And it's the biggest blessing to be able to be here with high schoolers and have those relationships with them. And it's awesome and very exciting for me to be with you guys today. And so what we're going to do today, that's a little bit about me. What we're going to do today is I'm actually bringing you guys into high school a little bit. We're continuing our high school series in John. And I've been going through it with them for about two or three months now. And where you guys are getting to pick up with us is John chapter 11. We're going to be in John chapter 11. In John 11, we're introduced to a new character. We're introduced to a man named Lazarus. We have not met Lazarus before. And so John gives us a little bit of background information of who this guy is. He's this man. He's from Bethany, which is in the region of Judea. We learn that he's the brother of these sisters, Martha and Mary. And we've met Martha and Mary before. We know they have a relationship with Jesus. We know that he's close with them, that he loves them, that he's friends with them. And the first five verses of John 11, we learn that he loves Lazarus too. We also learn that Lazarus is sick. It's not his best day. And so with all that in mind, we know Jesus knows Lazarus. He loves Lazarus. Lazarus is sick. And we get that in five verses. And then we get to verse six. And I'm going to read it for you guys. Um, and we get to the words in verse 6, and it becomes a little bit confusing. It won't be on the screen. I'll actually read verse 5, too. Verse 5 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And then verse 6. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Guys, we have a problem with these verses. If Lazarus is someone that he loved, why isn't he in a hurry? Because we learned something in this story. We learned that between the time of Jesus hearing that his friend who he loves is sick, and by the time he actually gets there, Lazarus didn't make it. Lazarus has died in that time. And now we have to confront this problem of Jesus, why weren't you there? 
If Jesus really loved Lazarus the way Scripture tells us, the way John tells us, then why wasn't he in more of a hurry to rescue this man that he loved? Why wasn't he there for them? We ask ourselves this question about ourselves and our own lives all the time. Right? If, if, if something goes wrong in life, it doesn't go to plan. You, 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 you thought you knew what God had for you, and then it's just taken away. And you're like, God, what is going on? I thought, I thought we were on the same page here. Where are you? Why aren't you rescuing me from this season? We all ask this question all the time. God, if you love me, why aren't you showing up the way I feel like you would be showing up? In my junior year of high school, my friends and I were in this very unique stage of life uh, where we all had our driver's license. But we didn't have it long enough where we could actually drive people. We had to drive alone. And so if like four or five people were hanging out. It looked like there was this massive party because there were just cars lining the sidewalks in front of the house, right? And you're like, whoa, that's a full house, but it's just seven guys playing Call of Duty or something. It's, there's nothing going on. And so we all had to drive separately, but my friends and I wanted to be different. We re- <laughs> Before it was cool, we really cared about our carbon emissions. You know, we wanted to limit our carbon f- footprint. And so we wanted to carpool. We were saving the world one carpool at a time. (laughs) And that was very valuable to us 16-year-old boys. Uh, Our parents, they didn't necessarily see things the way we did. They cared more about the law or our personal safety uh, and not driving with people who don't really know how to drive yet. And so whenever we were hanging out at friends' houses and we had carpooled, we had to do this whole charade when we were leaving. You know, we had to pretend we were leaving separately. And so I remember this one time, I was at my friend Zach's house. There was like six of us there. And I was driving home with another friend. I won't say his name. And when I get into the story, you'll know why. Uh, and we're going to leave. And we do this whole thing where he's like, you know what? I think it's, it's late. I'm going to leave. Uh, it was a pleasure being with all you guys. And then, he, you know, it goes up to the parents, shakes their hand. Thanks for having me. You guys are just the best hosts. He's saying all the right things, you know. And he's like, bye, friends. I'm gone. I wait five minutes. And then it's my turn to do the exact same thing. And I'm like, all right, guys, you know what? Actually, it is getting late. I'm going to leave too. And so I do all the things like, oh, you guys are the best. I'll miss you. Um, and then I shake the parents' hands, look them in the eyes, like, thank you for hosting us. You guys are just so loving and caring, and you provide for us. We just love being at your house. Um, and I say goodbye to them, and then I go walk out of the house around the corner, and I hop in my buddy's car. And we're going down this road, and it's, it's one of those... Um, back country mountain roads in Los Gatos. And uh, my friend is driving a Kia, but he thinks it's a Porsche. And we make it, it's always the Kia drivers that think they have a sports car. Uh, (laughs) We make it three turns and we come up to this hairpin turn. And if it was a big enough road, there would have been like a 10 mile an hour speed limit, I'm guessing. Uh, And we're taking it at 45. And I'm looking at the turn like, I don't think we're making that. And then I start leaning strongly to the right. I'm like, why is gravity changing? And I look up at my friend. I'm like, why am I actually looking up at my friend? He's like four feet above me. I look out of my passenger window and I see asphalt. I'm like, I shouldn't be seeing asphalt there. I should be seeing asphalt there. And I realize we are, uh, we're trying to pull off a Doc Hudson in the movie Cars. If you know when he's like driving on the dirt and he passes people on the wall, we're driving on like, the side of this mountain above the road. And we get tossed around, thrown around. We get spit back onto the actual road where we belonged. And we eventually come to a stop. And I look at myself and I'm okay. Not bleeding, not hurt. I'm good. I look at my friend. He's not bleeding. He's not hurt. He's okay. We get out of the car. It's not okay. The front end is gone. The, the tires are like pointing each other at each other, and you're like, that's not good. Uh, there's antifreeze and oil everywhere, and, you're, and it, the car is smoking, so like, we should probably get back because that's not going to end well for us. Uh, it was probably safe, but we didn't know anything. Uh, and I look at the car, and I look at the way it's facing, and I look at the road, and I realize if we had just slid 10 more feet, 15 more feet, there was actually another ledge on the side of the road. 
And we had another 30, 40, 50 feet that we would have went over and rolled and fell down. Now, the point of that story is not that God protected me from going through a car crash. We crashed. It was scary. It was painful. It was worse for him because he had to deal with getting a new car, but we crashed. But looking back, I remember that God was there through the crash with us, and he was protecting us through the crash. And maybe I was better off with that. Because I don't remember all the times I could have been in an accident, but God just prevented it entirely. All the times I could have hit someone, but narrowly missed them. All the times I could have been hit, um, but they narrowly missed me. All the times I was just barely not in the wrong place at the wrong time because God protected me from those car crashes. But I remember the time I did crash, and then God was there with me through it. I think that's why Jesus waits two days in John 11. That's why he waits two days before he goes to Judea. See, John tells us that Jesus gets to Lazarus four days after Lazarus died. Do some math with me. Jesus waited two days after he was told that Lazarus was sick, and then he gets there four days after he dies, that means the walk to Lazarus took him two days, right? Two plus two equals four. You guys are following me. That's the math there. I didn't realize this till reading back this story, but either way, Jesus would have gone to Lazarus after he died. If it's a two-day walk and he leaves immediately, Lazarus is still dead two days before Jesus gets there. So now we have to ask ourselves the question, what's the difference between dead for two days and dead for four days? Well, actually, there's a big difference. According to Jewish mysticism at the time, uh, for the first three days after death, you weren't fully dead, you were just mostly dead. None of my high scores are laughing at that. They don't know the reference. Oh, well. But by the fourth day, you were, you were, all, you were all dead. And the reason why they believed this is because they believed after the body died that the spirit actually hovered above it for three days waiting to re-enter it. By the fourth day, it was too late. And so I think Jesus waits until it's too late on purpose. He doesn't want to just be late. He wants to be late, late. Because he wants everyone to know who's about to watch him over these next couple hours that if it wasn't for him, that there would be no way that Lazarus was going to find life. You could not explain it any other way other than the healing power of Jesus. And so Jesus gets to Judea. And when he gets to Judea, he meets Martha and then Mary. These are the sisters of Lazarus, remember? And he has these conversations with them. And I just want to look at what they say when they're greeting Jesus. First is going to be Martha. It's going to be in verse 21. Verse 21 says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then down in verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They both tell him the exact same thing. It's word for word. And they're, it's a very brave and honest and upfront thing to say to Jesus, right? But in this, they're making an incredible statement of faith. Because they're recognizing that Jesus is not just a normal guy. He has power. He has healing power. They're saying, we believe you have power to heal our brother. Or you did. We believe that this could have gone differently because we know you're not just a man. So it's an amazing statement of faith. But when you look at this and you look at how they say it, you see Mary fall to her, to her feet, fall, what does it say? She falls down to the ground. And you read the other verses and they're grieving and they're mourning and you know the hurt they're going through. You have to think, they're not, maybe they're not saying it super directly, maybe they're saying it indirectly, but they're definitely thinking this 
Jesus, why didn't you do something? You could have done something. Why weren't you here? And remember, we ask ourselves this question all the time. Right? When our lives aren't going the way we wanted to, when we have a plan and things that start to fall apart, we're, God, where are you? Why aren't you here for me? And in John 11, Jesus looks at both of them and he says, just wait. I will do something. Story's not done yet. Death has not won here. And he says this, with this in this conversation with Martha, and I want to focus on his conversation with Martha specifically this morning. Uh, he makes this statement. It's going to be in verse 25. And the statement is really just the entire driving force of this story of Lazarus. And I think it's the entire driving force of just the gospel of who Jesus is. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Emphasis on the. He's not a source of resurrection. He's not a source of life. He's not one of many sources of life. He is, he is it. He is the resurrection and he is the life. No resurrection apart from him, no life apart from him. There's no eternity apart from Jesus. And I don't want to spoil the story here, um, but Lazarus will be resurrected. But before he gets there, before Jesus resurrects Lazarus, he weeps. Verse 35 in John 11, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Before that, though, you have verse 33. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, that's speaking of Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Then you have verse 38 later on, and it says, Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. Speaking of the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus knows the end of the story. He knows that Lazarus is going to be resurrected. He knows that through him he'll find life, but that does not stop him from being deeply present with those he loved. Mary and Martha were hurting, and he was hurting with them. They were weeping, and he was weeping with them. I don't know what everyone is going through in this room, but I think it's a safe bet that there's a lot of hurt and pain in this room. Maybe it's a little too similar to Mary and Martha. Maybe it was a loss of a loved one, a loss too soon. Uh, maybe it was a loss of a job. Maybe it was the end of a relationship. Uh, maybe it was a health diagnosis that didn't go the way you thought. Maybe it's a car crash like I talked about. I don't know. But what I need you to know is that whatever you are going through, you don't have a God in heaven who is just distant and separating himself from you and your hurt. He's not just watching un, un, unfazed, uninvolved. He's someone who wants to be there with you the way he was with Mary and Martha. And he wants to weep with you and mourn with you. You have a God who shows up for you. He showed up for Mary and Martha. And he wants to show up for you too. This story has a miraculous ending. It's suffering that turns into joy and into celebration. After four days of death, uh, Jesus shows up at the tomb of Lazarus. He says, uh, let's move the stone that's covering it. And he says, Lazarus, get up, get out. And Lazarus does. After four days of being dead, Lazarus walks and has life again. And when we are suffering, we want that, don't we? We want that miraculous ending to the story. We want to be saved from our pain and from our suffering, but we're not promised that. Not always. We're actually promised something a lot better. As this miracle, it's not actually done for Lazarus. It's a miracle that's done for all those around Jesus, all those around Mary and Martha watching Jesus. Because he wants to point their direction somewhere else. He wants to point them to a greater miracle that is coming. 
one that will show the world that he is the source of resurrection life. And when Jesus is talking to Martha, he's not even promising her the resurrection of Lazarus. He's talking about that future miracle. In his conversation, verse 25, we read this. It says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. That's followed by verse 26, which says, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Whoever. It's not just eternal life for Jesus or for Lazarus or for Mary and Martha, who he's talking to. He is promising eternal life for anyone who looks at him and says, I believe, which means there is eternal life for you. Today is Palm Sunday, and I love being able to teach this message on Palm Sunday. If you don't know what that is, it's the start of Holy Week. It's what we celebrate as the start of Jesus' journey to the cross, right? He starts entering Jerusalem triumphantly, and then he ends up on a cross, and then the week ends triumphantly. Spoiler alert, we will celebrate that in a week. But I look at this story, I'm starting to think his actual journey to the cross starts here in John 11. It starts with him going to Judea to save a man that he loved. And I think, I'm pretty sure it starts here because of his conversation with the disciples. In the beginning of John 11, he's like, hey guys, we're going to go help Lazarus out. We're going to Judea. And his disciples are like, Jesus, don't do that. Last time you were there, they tried to stone you. They tried killing you, Jesus. That's going to happen again. He's like, they have this discussion back and forth. He's like, I'm still going. And he says, guys, uh, Lazarus, my friend, he's fallen asleep. And they're like, that is great. Sleep is actually really good for people. He'll rest. He'll get better. That's a great thing. We all need more sleep, really, Jesus. This is good for him. He's like, nope, we're going. And it turns out what his disciples were saying was true. Because not shortly after Jesus going back to Judea, he does end up on a cross. They were right. We have a God who knows suffering. He suffered with Mary and Martha. He grieved with Mary and Martha, and he suffered on a cross. And he did that so that we could experience a life beyond that suffering. He made it so we could experience eternal life with him and the Father in heaven. Free of all pain, free of all grieving, free of all suffering. Maybe you know Jesus. Maybe you're in the room and you know Jesus today. You just need that reminder. Because you're in one of those seasons of sickness, or you're in the middle of that car crash, and things are falling apart. Things aren't going the way you thought they would. Jesus is right there with you. Can you hold on to that? Can you remember that? He is with you in your suffering. He was with Mary and Martha. He grieved with them. He wept with them. He wants to do that with you. And he promised Martha eternity with him past that suffering. Eternity in heaven where there is no more of that. It's just celebration. It's just joy. It's just worship. Maybe you don't know Jesus personally. And if that's you, just know that there is so much more than what you are living right now. Right now can be marked by grieving and pain and suffering and things not going your way, but there is so much more to that. And there is more to that because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on a cross. It is amazing after four days, Jesus called out Lazarus and he walked out of his tomb. But what is more amazing is what he promises Martha and what's to come. And what's to come is Jesus has put himself on a collision course with the cross. 
He is running to suffering. He is running to that pain. He is going to have this epic showdown with sin and with death, and he is going to defeat it. And he's going to do it for Martha. He's going to do it for Mary. He's going to do it for Lazarus. He's going to do it for you. If you look to him and say, I believe. And it's because I believe that in the future car crashes, whether I avoid them entirely, whether I have them and he's protecting me through it, or whether I have a car crash and that's my last day here. I am promised that God is with me through it, that Jesus is there with me through it. And I am promised that I can have eternity with him. And if you believe that, like I do, then there's good news on the other side of this life. Or if you just put your trust in him, like Lazarus, like Jesus, you too can leave the tomb behind. Can I pray? Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. And we praise you for that. And we just praise you for your character and for who you are, Lord, that when we suffer, when we can't make sense of what our life looks like right now, that you are right there by our side, weeping with us, mourning with us. You are deeply troubled in spirit with us. You don't want to watch us suffer. Lord, and you have promised something past that suffering. You decided you were going to suffer more than any of us could. You were going to go on that cross. You were going to go to war with death and with sin, and you were going to win so that we could experience life beyond that suffering. Lord, I pray that everyone in this room believes that. If they believe it and they've forgotten it, Lord, just remind them that you're there in their suffering, that you're there in their pain. Lord, for those who don't know you, may you just keep tugging on their heartstrings. Bring them back into your presence repeatedly until they realize they have a God out there who wants a relationship with them. He is good, and his name is Jesus. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Christ our King. The fear that held us now gives way to Him who is our peace. His final breath upon the cross is now alive in Your name, Your name. His victory, all praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory, all praise will rise to Christ our of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting Spirit, I will rise from the ashes of you. 
Father God, thank you that we are not a dead people. We are brought alive by your love and your mercy and your salvation, bringing us out of darkness and into light. Lord, thank you for taking the grave clothes off of us, taking the stench off of us, and bringing us back to life. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in Christ, and we pray in the church. Say amen and amen, and you are dismissed in that newness of life. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.